Ladies and gentlemen, you will have followed that line of reasoning by Mr. Robertson. I have to say, the logic of it escapes me, but it is a matter for you to consider. In 1990, a club manager was attacked as he left Invergordon Social Club with the club's takings. He was then taken in his own car, bleeding from head injuries, to a wood nearby. There he was further assaulted before being abandoned. He was left lying on the ground, partly clothed, with his wrists handcuffed behind his back to a small tree. He subsequently died. Two men were arrested and charged with his murder. One was James Casey, then aged 25. The other was George McNairn, then aged 22. Both men were interviewed by the police. Both men accused the other. Each said that they were only a lookout and signaller. It was the other man who was meant to snatch the club manager's bag containing the takings. Both men said that they did not know the other had a weapon and were horrified when the murder took place. James Casey claims that he was wearing dark clothing, a stocking mask, heavy woolen socks over shoes and white cotton gloves which were ready visible at night. He stood on a grassy embankment a short distance away. When the manager came out of the club, he signalled to McNairn by waving the, with the white gloves. When the manager walked round the corner, rather than snatching the bag, McNairn repeatedly hit the manager on the head with a hammer. From there, it was all downhill. James Casey claims that McNairn took the club manager in his car to the wooded area. He then met McNairn at an arranged point over an hour later. McNairn claims he was on lookout and that both he and Casey went in the car to the woods. McNairn claims it was Casey who then completed the murder of the manager by further assaulting him and handcuffing him to the tree. A trial took place from the 15th of January to the 7th of February 1991 at Inverness. Both men had lodged special defences of incrimination. This meant that both admitted to being there but claimed their role was that of lookout and signaller rather than bag snatcher and murderer. As the trial developed, the crucial element for the jury became who wore the white gloves. The person who wore the white gloves was merely a signaller. Although both were taking part in a robbery, both claimed that the use of a weapon was totally unexpected. Both the defence and prosecution teams emphasised to the jury the importance of who was wearing the white gloves. Both of the accused gave oral evidence against the other. Apart from that, what evidence was there? Casey stated that he was the lookout. He denied murdering the manager and getting in the car. No DNA, fibres or fingerprint evidence linked him to being inside the car or at the wooded area. The evidence against Casey was either circumstantial or based on McNairn's testimony. In contrast, there was a great deal of evidence against McNairn. He admitted driving the car. 
he knew the wooded area where the victim was taken, as he worked close by and admitted having spent time there with his girlfriend. There was evidence from people out walking with a torch, who saw the car and driver but no passenger. This matched Casey's version of events and contradicted McNairn's version. The head psychiatrist from Carstairs did several interviews with McNairn and Casey. He concluded Casey was incapable of performing the murder, but that McNairn was capable due to his mental state at the time. Crucially, McNairn had motive. He suspected the manager was having an affair with his ex-girlfriend. So, from an objective point of view, and certainly from the point of view of James Casey, the jury was going to find McNairn guilty of the murder. That is, until Lord McLean destroyed his defence. Now, let's cut to the chase. Let's look at the misdirection. The judge, while giving his charge, the final instructions to the jury, recounted the chief argument made by the advocate, Mr Robertson, in the defence of James Casey. He then said, The logic of it escapes me. His exact words were, Therefore, said Mr Robertson, McNairn was not wearing the white gloves. It was Casey who was wearing the white gloves that night, and he was a signaller. Ladies and gentlemen, you will have followed that line of reasoning by Mr. Robertson. I have to say, the logic of it escapes me, but it is a matter for you to consider. Think of what effect this would have on the jury. Objectively, all the evidence points to McNairn. The jury would probably have found McNairn guilty. But then the judge destroys part of Casey's defence. Let's hear what he said again. Therefore, said Mr Robertson, McNairn was not wearing the white gloves. It was Casey who was wearing the white gloves that night, and he was a signaller. Ladies and gentlemen, you will have followed that line of reasoning by Mr Robertson. I have to say, the logic of it escapes me, but it is a matter for you to consider. Throughout the trial, Lord McLean developed a personal impression of McNairn. He stated the following in his appeal report. McNairn had no criminal record and he struck me as weak, rather pathetic and easily led. This, we contend, led to Lord McLean being convinced of Casey's guilt. Lord McLean is admitting that during the trial he lost his impartiality. Remember that Lord McLean's view contrasted with the psychiatrist from Carstairs, who interviewed both McNairn and Casey. He found McNairn to be capable of this type of violence, whereas Casey was not. This, we contend, led Lord McLean to destroy Casey's defence when giving his charge to the jury. In addition to the misdirection, some other important information came to light in 2010. Due to new DNA testing techniques, James Casey's DNA was found inside one of the white gloves. The Scottish Criminal Cases Review Commission appealed the case. Unfortunately, the appeal was unsuccessful as the DNA evidence wasn't fully accepted as conclusively proving that Casey wore the white gloves. 
The Fair Trial Project contends that if this evidence was available at the original trial, then the logic of it escapes me, misdirection would not have taken place. It would have been clear that James Casey was wearing the white gloves and was the lookout and signaller. The Fair Trial Project contends that after seeing the evidence against McNairn, the jury would have found him guilty of the murder. The only reason he walked free was because the judge, Lord McLean, destroyed the defence of his co-accused. Both defence teams emphasised to the jury the importance of deciding who was wearing the white gloves. The judge then dismissed Casey's argument about this by saying, the logic of it escapes me. The only effect this could have on the jury is that they too would dismiss this argument. The result is that an innocent man has spent over 30 years in jail. James Casey could not believe that he had been found guilty of murder. He lost all trust in the lawyers working on his behalf and decided to appeal by himself. James Casey states that At my appeal against conviction in 1992, I represented myself. I had not seen and was not given the charge. Plus, I was not given any other reports or facilities to help me prepare my appeal. After being contacted by James Casey, the Fair Trial Project found the misdirection. James Casey has spent over 30 years in prison. He should be released today.